Hey, everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Steve from Vancouver, Canada. And uh, he was gracious enough to volunteer to share his story in the hopes that his story will help some of you. So, Steve, welcome. And I appreciate you. you. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to do this. Yeah. So, um, why don't you tell us a little uh, story here? Story time from Steve. Yeah. Okay. What you know? Where where were you? What happened? What what'd you go through? And where'd you end yeah. up? All that yep. kind of fun stuff along the way. So I'll start with. Um, I'm 55. Okay. I think that's important that we start with that because we're going to go way back. All right. And um, we're going to go all the way back to the year 1977. Wow. That's when it started for me. I was age 10. And uh, at that time, I was in grade five. So I was just a little kid playing around at school. And one day I was out on the field at recess and, uh, you know, something happened and it felt as though I had been stabbed in the back. Wow. Okay. So it felt like somebody had hit me from behind with a knife and basically put a knife into my back in the, about the upper right side. I'm going to do one thing. Yes. A lot of people who watch these videos uh, are very highly alert, sensitive, vigilant, Yeah. Uh, very susceptible to language. And so um, words like stabbed in the back can be fairly sure. triggering to people. Okay. I am just going to caution you to tone it down. It should not be descriptions from a horror movie. Okay. Yeah. No, like, we'll take a step back. <laughs> so uh, for me, it's not a big deal anymore. So you I know, understand like, that. But for people watching who are brand new in this and like yeah, in yeah. the middle of their pain, they don't want to hear about stabbing, <laughs> hitting, you know, all that. I don't think I'd want to either. Um, so anyways, I had a really sharp pain in my back and it was, um, better. you know, <laughs> it, yeah, it was strong and it was, um, so strong that I had difficulty breathing. It was really powerful. And at that time I, I didn't, know what to do so i basically just lied down on on the ground on the gravel out on the field mm-hmm. and you know the kids came over and asked me what's up and i told them and um, they went and got the teachers and one of the teachers came out and um talked to me and uh, asked me what was going on and i and i told them that you know i was in pain and um, they went and got the nurse the nurse came out uh and they put me on a stretcher and they carried me in the back into the school and they put me in the nurse's room and at age 10 they did what teachers would do they called my parents mm-hmm. but at this point i just want to kind of take a step back and explain that you know pdp is something that um i basically learned from my father and i didn't know this until later in life um you know in my home my dad my parents were great parents they took great care of me but they had a lot of their own baggage and my dad he was a blue collar worker and uh, he had been a single child who was who didn't have a mother. So he grew up just with him and his dad, nobody else, uh, his dad working six days a week. And uh, I think because of that, my dad was he was a pretty angry guy mm-hmm. and uh, he had a lot of anger and uh, he would be in either one of two states. He would either be at work, not too happy about his job. Or he'd be at home and he'd be on disability because if he would have pain in his back, then he'd be really happy. He'd be a nice guy. And that's what my little brain kind of learned at the time. And I think it sort of picked that up. And, you know, my mom was the primary caregiver uh, in those days. And she basically, you know, did everything. But on that day, it was my dad who came and picked me up. And he was actually in a great mood. And he said to me, you know, he carried me out to the car and he said, you know, Steve, you're going to be just fine. I'm going to take you to the chiropractor. I know exactly what's going on. I know exactly what's wrong with you. And you are just going to be amazed at how well you're going to feel once I get my guy to take care of you. And he did. And he took me to his chiropractor and I got all this great attention from my dad and he was all happy. And his chiropractor uh, did whatever uh, the manipulations were and the pain went away immediately. And I was fine and it was wonderful. And uh, for me, it was a miracle at age 10. And uh, I was free of it. And I was free of it for a while, but not that long. It came back. 
Mm-hmm. And um, it came back four years later. I was in, I was age 14. And uh, the second incident happened again sometime at school. And uh, I went back to the chiropractor. Uh, my, either my parents took me or I went by myself. And it worked. But it didn't work as quickly. It just took a little bit longer this time. And from 1981 to 85, and those are the year, years when I was age 14 to 18, I would go through these cycles of having this pain in my back at different areas of my back. Mm-hmm. And I would go to the chiropractor and it would work. It would take longer and longer for it to work. It would be, I'd have to have more appointments and coming back and, uh, you know, the, my confidence in that, um, in that process decreased over those years and um so you know now i'm 18 and uh i'm starting to get this pretty regularly it's become pretty normal for me and i started to complain a lot this is age 1985 to 1992 age 18 to 25 i would call it i would typically call it my complaining phase i complained a lot to anybody who wanted to listen to me i really thought that i was um i really felt sorry for myself I thought, you know, here I am, this guy who's, you know, got this uh, deficiency, you know, something, something wrong with me, some, something wrong, it's something wrong physically. And um, in this time, I met my wife, my current, my wife that I'm still married to. We've been married for over thirty years, and she would notice me going through these cycles of uh, intense back pain that would cause me to have to manage my life in a way that I couldn't do things that I like to do. I was a sporty person. You know, I really liked uh, I really liked to do in lots of different sports. I loved lifting weights, and uh, I would go into these uh, cycles, and I would have to stop everything. And I always seemed to be at a time when I was really starting to get good progress. So, for example, if I'm you know, if I'm at the gym and I'm building muscle, right when I really felt the best is when I would get one of these incidents that would just knock me back. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'd be in bed or I just couldn't even get up and move. And I would be wandering around feeling sorry for myself. And, uh, you know, just generally at this point where, you know, I've had this for years and I guess this is the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. And in this time, uh, I went to university. Um, I was a, uh, I was enrolled in engineering and I completed that very, very, um, stressful uh, high demanding uh, university education i made it through that and um, again i would have these cycles where i'd be sitting in class and i'd be sitting there going oh my god this is just this is just unbearable and uh, you know at the same time i was sort of learning to live with it you know i'd kind of given up on chiropractor uh, because mm-hmm. it would just take so long to work uh, i ended up um, getting out of university i i took a, a job with a corporation and um it was a um uh, a uh, a really demanding job as a product development engineer at a corporation and it was a high stress high stress environment and my wife and i were married in uh, 92 and so here we are living in toronto and i'm getting these incidents and you know it was a it was a really competitive place and i really couldn't even tell anybody what was going on because i just didn't want to have to be seen as some guy who's not good enough right you know so i wouldn't didn't want to be judged against my peers in a way that would prevent me from being promoted or moving up in the company so i basically just kept it to myself but i was experiencing you know significant pain i'd have difficulty you know here i am a guy in his uh, 20s and i would have real difficulty just even getting out of bed in the morning that was tough just that yeah um we were married in 92 uh we're living in toronto and you know i thought oh maybe i'll go back to the doctor and and i did that and um you know i thought okay i'll approach this from another way rather than going to a chiropractor i'll approach this through the medical system and i went to my gp and uh he sent me to somebody else and so whoever it was ordered an x-ray and um to see what was going on there and uh at the same time i would i had found a chiropractor and i was working with him you know i was just i was just really looking for short-term relief just anything i just try anything you know you're at this point where yeah you're just looking for anything that's going to help you and um you know i really remember this well i had 
gotten the x-ray back and you only called me and said you know we found something in your x-ray your backs got some issues with the uh, compressed discs or you know something's not normal mm -hmm. something course that causes all kinds of red lights and flyers to go off in my brain yeah, yeah. that's what here yeah. but you know so i've been thinking about this all this time and i think well there it's confirmed you know i've got this physical problem but at the same time you know i was a bit angry and i probably learned that from my father i was mm -hmm. angry about the whole situation and you know i somehow my i guess i must have done it but my x-rays got sent off to the chiropractor that i was working with and this guy was he was pretty aggressive and um you know i got frustrated and i said to him well i'm just not going to come anymore this isn't working and uh, i got this you know a couple weeks later i got this really really strongly worded letter from him and it was basically a bit of a doom letter it said you know we've looked at your x-rays you know, you've got this uh, degenerative problem. And, uh, you know, even though you're sitting here, you know, this this guy in your 20s, you're, you're, you're going to just, you're, you're, you're going to continue to decline. And really what we need to do is, we, what we need to do is you got to come back and see me. And I'm going to help you to manage the decline so that the decline is not as, as quick as what it could be. Yeah, that was tough. Oh. and uh how dare he yeah it was strong and you know i you know it was um what do i what you know i was the kind of guy who my response was i got angry at him and you know i basically said well no rather than that i just basically said screw you and i took his letter and i wrote a few things on it and sent it back to him and said you know that's it i'm on my own i'll just accept what's going on and um but I'm not going to be this cripple that's, I'm not going to be this cripple that's working with this guy and, you know, really? trying to beat myself through, you know, this. So that was the start of me saying, you know, I got to have to find a way in order to live with this. And, uh, you know, I said to myself, you know, here I am, age 25. I'm still just a kid. You know, I'm a talented engineer and I've got a bright future ahead of me. And, you know, I've got to find a way to, um, rather than try to get rid of this, it's not going to leave me. I'm going to have to try to way, find a way to manage my way through it. Right. Uh, to 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 keep it as something that I've got, but just not let it screw me in what I'm trying to do. You know, I've got my new right. life. And we're building, I'm building my career and we're talking about having a family. You know, in around 1992, so here I am, 25, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to stop complaining. I got tired of listening to myself. People got tired of listening to me. They did. You know, you just, you know, I'd be somewhere and I'd start telling them about how, what, what was going on. And you can just see their eyes kind of glaze over and look away. Yeah. You know, they just, it was just, they just, you know, they just got tired of it. And honestly, I got tired of me. That's what happened. I just got tired of listening to my own stuff. So I decided what I would do is I would just suffer. And I would suffer with no remedy. And so for 11 years from 1992, to around 2003, what I did was I just continued on with my career. I would go through these uh, cycles of, uh, of uh, pain and uh, I just didn't tell anybody. And I would just force myself to walk normally. And uh, I would do, I would almost force myself to not even listen to myself. You know, I would say, okay, this is what it is. You're just gonna have to suck it up and you're just gonna have to accept it. That's the way it is. You've, you've got this physical, physical problem and uh you know tough that's the way it is and that's what i would say to myself you know and at this time i was really busy with work i did a lot of travel um, i was in some very very high stress situations uh, my wife and i moved uh we moved from toronto to germany in 94 we moved we were there for a couple of years we moved to italy and then we moved back to vancouver in 1997 and then again in 98, we moved back to Germany for five years and we were there from 98 until 2003. And, you know, I can remember as an example, I was in Germany and, uh, oh, around, around 2001. And I can remember, you know, going to a trip to Bangkok to see a customer, to see a very important customer. And I was on the sales side, the technical sales side of things for this company. And, We'd started up a new plant in um, in Germany, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I was um, with the with another person. I was uh, to head off to uh, a corporation down in Thailand in Bangkok, and you know we prepared for a month for this meeting. It was really really important. It was a do or die meeting, and here I am traveling, um, you know, eighteen hours uh, all the way to the other side of the world and getting set up. And I remember walking into this meeting with this uh, person, with my colleague, and you know, instantly. The second I sat down to that meeting, my back went out. And, you know, I thought at the time, this is crazy. You know, why does this always seem to happen when I don't want it, when it's the worst time, you know? And I did what I always did was I would feel sorry for myself, but I sucked it up and I and I worked my way through. And, you know, at this time, I also noticed that my wife started having back pain. She started having the same issue and she started having to deal with it because of the stress and certain things that were going on in our life at the time and she was trying different modalities but the interesting thing i found that we noticed was that we never had it at the same time (laughs) i would have it or she would have it but we would never have it together it's almost like we it was almost like this little thing that we cultivated together that we would hand back and forth to each other you know and um yeah it was just interesting You know, around 2003, uh, here I am now, I'm age, you know, 38. I've had this problem. I've had this challenge for 28 years. It's just a part of my life. It's just what it is. And I decided that at that time, I would learn to live with it. I would say to myself, I'm going to actually, rather than even just ignore it, I'm just going to accept it. I'm just going to bring it on and accept it and don't even don't even worry about it. I'm not going to complain. I'm not even going to have bad thoughts. It's just what it is. And it's what I've been dealt with. And uh, I became self-employed with a partner of mine. And I moved back to the uh, West Coast. And uh, so my partner was in Holland. And him and I had a business. And uh, our daughter came in 2005. There was a lot of stress with that. Um, We were really busy. And uh, I'm back on the road again. I'm traveling. Um, We had a... (laughs) We had a... We have a pool at our current home. We still live there now. And uh, I was in Korea for meetings. And, uh, you know, it's a long ways. It's a long ways home. And, you know, you come home from one of these one of these uh, trips and you're just, you're, you're wasted. Yeah. You know, it takes you a week just to recover. And uh, I come all the way home from Korea. It was in the fall. And uh, my wife is just overloaded. We've got a three-year-old daughter. She's overloaded with that. And I look out in our yard and our pool is absolutely filled up with leaves all the leaves have fallen while i was gone and they filled up the pool and you know i never wanted to have a pool um i kind of accepted it with the house and it was one of those things where we say okay well it's there we'll just you know do our best and it was always a pain and it always seemed that that pool was kind of like my bane the bane of my existence because i was always looking after it and i remember going out there to the pool feeling really sorry for myself and i got out a um scoop and i was just starting to scoop the leaves out of the pool and boom out goes my back again massive pain i dropped that uh i dropped that uh the 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 net and i crawl back into the house and lie down on the kitchen floor because that's all i can do my wife's and i see my daughter's looking at me with this three-year-old She's, you know, what's the matter here, Steve? Or dad, what's the matter? And uh, I said, oh, go with mom, you know? And it was almost like I had to emote and show everybody just how bad I was. But I was in a lot of pain and I really couldn't get up off the floor. That's how bad it was. I've been there. Yeah. And I, so I, we had met some friends in the neighborhood and one of them was a chiropractor. I had stopped going to chiropractors by this time. But, you know, when you're really hurting, you'll do anything. And so uh, I called him up. His name was Barry. And I said to him, uh, you know, it was on a Friday. I had just come back. And I said, uh, you know, I told him what was going on. I said, maybe you could see me and you can help me. And he said, you know, I can't. We're heading away for the weekend. But, you know, he gave me some exercises. You can do this. And he said, Steve, there's something that's important. He said, the good news is is that it's going to go away by the time you're 60. And I'll never forget him saying that that it's going to go away by the time you're 60. And I, because, and the reason why I say that is I always saw the body as something mechanical. Mm-hmm. Like a car. And cars wear out. 
Sure. But but to, but but when you look at what he said, it doesn't. It's 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 it goes against that whole concept of a of a of a of a, of a mechanical thing that wears out. And that really struck me. And I thought a lot about that. And I said, you know, if it's he said he he told me he said I have clients they come to me for these years, but by the time they're sixty, they just don't come anymore. They're better. And I couldn't explain that, but it really made me do a lot of thinking. And, yeah. you know, it was when I started to see myself different, not as a mechanical, not as a mechanical operation. I started to think, well, maybe I don't know things as well as I really think I do. Sure. Maybe, yeah, maybe my maybe my body is uh, different than, than, than the way I've been thinking about it from the typical engineering standpoint. And right. at that time, uh, my wife, Trish, and I, we had... Um, you know, we had started doing some things like qigong and different types of meditations as different types of ways to um, to deal with stress. And, you know, it would it had caused me to become a lot more open about uh, things just in general to say, you know, to be able to say, you know, I really don't know too much, uh, but I'd like to try to find out and learn more information. And, we, you know, I was becoming more open versus a closed minded person who would say, you know, this is the way it is. And these are the rules. And this is the way things have to be done. You know, in 2008, you know, now we are here. I am age 41. I've had this for 30 years. Uh, we're living in a new uh, neighborhood. And the neighborhood itself is kind of an old neighborhood. It's um, um, near to Vancouver. There's a lot of old stores. Right. And uh, I had been driving home or driving through the neighborhood. And I'd always noticed this little bookstore, a little bookstore called Visions Bookstore. And uh, it was just really nondescript in a little, in a, in a, in a little, uh, little build, a little co- alcove of a building. And I had been out for a walk one day, and uh, you know, I went by this bookstore, and I, I thought, oh, I'm going to go in there and have a look. And I went in, and it was just, you know, it was kind of dingy. And it kind of smelled of old books, and there was an old guy sitting down behind the counter. And uh, he was kind of wrinkly, and he smiled at me, and I was looking around. He struck up a conversation with me. He said, uh, he introduced himself, as his name was Bruce. And he said, you know, this is, this is my bookstore. I own this bookstore. And um, I made this bookstore because I was an alcoholic, and I had been living on the streets. I was in the gutter, basically. And... I um, had a message from God. This is what he said to me. God told me that he wanted me to uh, put myself back together, quit drinking, and make a bookstore to help people. And um, I would, you know, on one part of it made me a little bit uncomfortable with him telling me this story. It was just kind of weird. But on the other side, I kind of felt myself a little bit, um what's the word i just kind of felt myself a little bit attracted to him in a way of well that's kind of interesting and it's really neat to see that you've cleaned yourself up but at the same time i kind of wanted to get out of there and uh but at the same time i also felt compelled to buy something you know there's this guy that's telling me the story and i mean how can i not buy it something and so you know i'm in there and i look around and i look up into the corner of the bookstore and i just see this one book and it's called Healing Back Pain. Just this one book. It's the first book I looked at. And I just pulled it out. And I said, well, I've had back pain my whole life. Nothing works, but what the hell? I'll just buy this book. And I look at the cover of the book. And I'm sure you've seen it. It's the one with the guy, the picture of a man's naked back on the cover. And the guy, and then he's holding his hand behind him. And I thought, oh, Jesus, it's just weird. It was cheap. It was 10, 20 bucks or something like that. And I so I brought that up to the counter. And he looked at me and he said, that's a good book. That's all he said. And okay. So I uh, I took the book home, and uh, my wife had been having the back pain at the time. I didn't. I told you that we kind of just handed it back and forth yeah, between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I threw it in. A, I threw it in a, in, in a uh, in the corner, and she didn't really pick it up or anything. And uh, but one year later, of course, um, I had another incident, and uh, I thought, oh. It reminded me of that book, and I went upstairs to our little area where we keep all our books, and I put that, picked that book up, and I sat down, and I read that book cover to cover. And for me, it was my, uh, well, I would call it the light bulb moment. 
I thought, oh my God. You know, I just, it just, it was, um, it sense. You know, yeah, it, it more than made sense. It more than, it, 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 it made, it not only did it make sense, it just showed me how everything else was just such nonsense. You know, to think that people, you know, like to think that, you know, if I've got a, if I've got a problem with my car, I take it to my mechanic and he fixes it and he gives it back to me. But at the same time, I've got a problem with my back and I go over and over and over again to chiropractors, you know, um, time after time. And people just, I got used to that, right? You know, to think that this is something that was created by my own mind, it made such sense to me. Um, it made more than sense. It was just like, I can't deny this. There's no way I can even deny this. This is just the truth. And I decided at that moment that I would accept that. And I decided that not only would I accept that, I would live that. I would live that with my life. And, you know, this is in, um, you know, this is in, when was this? This was in 2009. It was still, there was still not a lot of access to information at that time, like what you do. It just wasn't that, you know, I really felt like I was on my own. It was just me and my book and this guy in New York who was a doctor who made sense to me. And um, what I did was I just decided that there was nothing wrong with me. It's just the way it's going to be. There's nothing wrong with me. And I'm not going to go and do any of that other stuff anymore. And, you know, it worked, but it didn't work quickly. I had to be really diligent. I had to believe. And what I found was that if I ever had any kind of doubts, then it was almost like Groundhog Day. It would set me right back to the beginning. And I noticed that. So when, if I had another incident, and I did, and my incidents would usually take maybe three to four months to resolve. And then they would come back and again in a month or two. The first time that I had an incident, I found that it resolved in about two months. And then the second time I had an incident, I cut it in half again. Maybe it went, it resolved in about a month. And then it just keep, and then I got more confidence. It gave me the confidence to be able to say, yeah, I know I'm on the right way. But you know where I was? I, I would have accepted anything. Like I was at the point where I said, I will just accept this. And just knowing that there's nothing wrong with me is already enough. If I know that there's nothing wrong with me, and if I keep getting pain, I even that's even more acceptable. It's more acceptable to me than than where I was. I call it swimming out past halfway. That's what I. Re, that's the way I refer to it. Is if I'm going to go for a swim across the lake, I've got to be able to swim out past halfway to be able to get to the other side. I've got to get to the point of no return, and that's the way I saw it. If I'm going to go out in that lake. And I'm going to go past halfway because I don't want to go back. I'm not going to go back to what it was. And, you know, it just kept getting better and better. And I kept getting more and more confidence. You know, I can remember um, as an example, being at the gym uh, with a friend of mine and um, we're working out and, uh, you know, we did a lot. Of, we did heavy weights then. And uh, I was doing shrugs and shrugs are, you know, you're, it's like you're standing there and you've got, 300, 400 pounds hanging, you know, in your hands from your shoulders. And uh, right when I was doing that, and, you know, you can, you can consider that mechanically what you're doing is you're compressing your back, right? You're compressing mm -hmm. the discs in your back theoretically. And I was doing those shrugs and boom, it just hit me. And I didn't say anything. I just put the weights down. I took a breath and I said to myself, you know, you're going to do this. I'm going to do this. And uh, I said to my brain, you're going to do this too. And uh, there's nothing wrong with me. And there's nothing wrong with you. And you and I are going to do this together. We're going to finish this off. And if you want to make it hurt, that's fine with me. I accept that. That's what you do. I'm going to do what I do. You make it hurt as much as you want, but I'm not going home. And I'm not, I'm going to finish this. I got back up. I locked myself in. I did another, I picked it up and it took 10 seconds basically 10 seconds for that pain to go away. And then I knew 
that was when I really knew. And by the end of my set of eight shrugs with 350 pounds hanging from my arms, I was pain-free. Then I really knew. Yeah. And you know what I mean? At that time, I, w- I was literally in tears because I had gotten that proof for myself. And I really f- realize now that, you know, really the battle is really only with yourself. The battle was just with me. Mm-hmm. And it really wasn't even a battle. You know, it's I've got this brain that's trying to look after me, right? And, you know, it's how I, my relationship with my brain is, you know, how do I, how, how do we relate to each other? And before that, I had always basically talked to myself from more of a kind of angry standpoint to say, hey, no, you know, screw you. This is it. You're doing this. We're doing this. But then I, th- after that, I kind of thought, you know, no, this is us together. And, you know, you're a part of me. And you're important, right? You're uh, like, like having a little, you know, I mean, I think it helped a lot having, you know, with our daughter. You know, you've got this child and you've got to comfort them and you've got to help them grow up to be um, functioning members of society and you've got to help them gain that confidence. I think that was what all I really, all I had to do with my brain was to say, Hey, look, you know, we've got this. And um, by then I really had it. And, you know, just as an example, by then I was 42. So here I am, I've started at age 10. So I had 32 years of this and, uh, and, you know, I got out of it and, as an example, you know, since then, I've had different times when I would have a twinge and the twinge would give me an indicator of what's going on. It was almost like a feedback loop of what was going on in my life. And as an example, I can remember being down in Mexico City, having to meet my partner and having to travel 10 years ago. And, and uh, I'm in my room and uh, he's not in yet. So I'm waiting for him. We've got lots of meetings. And I remember standing up and then I'd get the twinge, it would go, it would grab onto my back. And I I remember going, you know, that's okay. You know, that's, I, I talked to myself and I said, you know, hey, look, you know, you don't, you want to be home. You want to be home with your family. You're missing your wife and your, and your daughter. And uh, you don't really want to be doing this. I know and that's okay. And I remember as I, I remember as I did, as I talked to myself, it was almost like, there was a hand holding my back and it would just kind of, each time I said something nice to myself, it would just let up a little bit more, a little bit more. It took about five, 10 seconds. And that's what I do now. You know, it's, um, I just sure don't get worried about it. Like I used to, you know, it's just, it's just not a problem. And, um, you know, I, I've been pain free for 11 years now and, uh, I don't even worry. Yeah. I don't even worry if it ever, I, it's, it's like I don't even worry about if it even came back. It's really not a concern for me. Um, I'm very careful about how I help others when other people are having pain. I typically really don't say too much other than I say, you know, I try to help them look inward. But I certainly don't preach because there's absolutely, I don't do what you do. I found your videos. I was just tooling around and I thought, oh, this is great. Finally, somebody who's able to do this. And I watch your videos a lot. My wife and I both do, and they're excellent. They really are. And I'm so glad that you gave me this opportunity to pass this on. I really appreciate it. You know, as a guy who doesn't even have any pain, I watch them because they give you that little bit of a reminder. It's and important. It's fascinating stuff, too. It's absolutely it's fascinating. fascinating. Yeah, it, it is fascinating. And I would say that, you know, it's even worse now than it was 15 years ago because everybody wants these instant fix. And doctors see everybody as this kind of like this m- piece of mechanical equipment. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's tough. I wrote a letter to Mr. Sarno. I was feeling so good. I used to, you know, I would talk to my wife and I would say, oh, hold on a sec. You know, just, I don't even do this anymore now. And I would call it Sarno Wing. Sarno Wing, it was a verb for me. I go, hold on a second. I just got to Sarno this. And she'd laugh. And, uh, but I wrote him a letter and he, um, he did get back to me and it was really nice. He said, you know, thanks for this. And I, I wrote him, said, I do Sarno Wing all the time. And uh, I really appreciate what he did because that was something that, you know, like it, it was really groundbreaking for him to be able to figure that out. Yeah. So I, so just to summarize, yeah, here I am, eleven years pain free, 
Love and uh, thank you. Yeah. And without a worry at all, you know, it's just it, like I could, my back could go up tomorrow and I wouldn't be worried about it at all. I would just say, oh yeah, I know what it is. And I don't know, like I thought, I've, I've watched some of the other testimonials and they're really good. And I, I just wonder if you've got, might have people who say, yeah, well, I'm different. You know, like I've had this for, you know, 30 years or I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if there's, I'm sure there's people who've had it longer than me, but I'm sure there's also people that have had it as long as me and with no, with no recovery and don't think that they're able to, and it, it, it really is possible. You know, I mean, in my 20s, I was told that I had a degenerative condition and that by now I'd be basically screwed. Yeah. And, uh, here I am, 55, and uh, I would say I'm probably in the best shape of my life. You know, I'm at the gym all the time and I'm and I'm keeping uh, keeping I'm keeping good shape physically. Yeah, you're like me. You feel better in your 50s than you did in your 30s. Yes. Yeah. I think that uh, that's true. Uh, you know, 30s are tough. You know, you're in between. I, I want to point out, um, so when you said the chiropractor said, yeah, usually by 65, uh, people stop coming. Yeah. And that all fits into Sarno's theories. And I've heard this term called the age of responsibility. Yeah. And the age of responsibility is as we get towards adult age, we more responsibilities more responsibilities and then as we get towards that 65 our responsibilities are less and with responsibilities comes a lot of emotions stress tension pressure self-judgment all sorts of things that our brains go that's dangerous yeah i i gotta warn steve here that something dangerous is going on mm -hmm. and you know I don't hear people having significant episodes as early as 10 or 11 years old that often. It certainly happens, um, but you've been able to really connect the dots and say, that's what that was. And it is interesting, though. People who do take a look back go, yeah, I've probably been dealing with this stuff my whole life. Yeah, right. That's it's. Um, and, you know, I mean, I get other stuff. I get, you know, I've had tinnitus. Um, I get. Uh, but I dealt with it. It went away. And uh, as a matter of fact, I had a I had a ringing in my left ear last night. Okay. And I was just having a little discussion with my wife. And uh, I remember her saying, are you not nervous? You're going to be doing a Zoom session tomorrow. And I said, well, no, not really. And then, bing, I got this little tingle. Oh, oh, that's interesting. My ear's ringing a little bit. Oh, that's probably because I'm a little bit nervous about having to about doing this tomorrow. And boom, it went away. So the you know for me the first I mean if I break my leg I've broken my leg if I cut my arm open but the body know, cut my arm open the body heals see yeah. what you brought up um, is something that I talk about all the time what does a recovery process look like you know mm -hmm. some people are like okay my pain finally went away it may or may not be recovered at that point because if they're still terrified of it coming back. No, they, they didn't get all the lessons yet. Where you are, you're like, I have no worries at all. And that's where I am. I have zero fear of it coming back. If I get a tweak, no fear, no attention. I know exactly what it is. I call it out for what it is. And it yeah. goes away very quickly. Yeah. You're fully recovered because you have recovered from the fear that yeah. kept you captive for 32 years. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a journey now look for anybody who's listening to this you know took steve 32 years took me 13 years 12 of which i knew about sarno because i made every mistake in the book i didn't i knew it intellectually but i didn't like apply the lessons i i was still full of fear focusing on it talking about it complaining about it avoiding things because right and you're laughing because you did all that stuff for a lot of years um when I finally was able to successfully neutralize the fear with the accurate information and just knowing, you take it from the intellectual knowledge, the book knowledge, but at some point, that intellectual knowledge that you probably understood as an engineer because you're a smart dude and you're like, okay, this is not a mechanical issue, but you understood it 
up here and eventually it kind of hit you here and that was yeah. probably the day in the gym when you were doing the shrugs when you just said well let's test this theory <laughs> sort of you didn't say that out loud but you were like nope not going to give in so it can hurt or not but i'm doing this yeah. your brain eventually said wait a minute steve's not afraid no there must not be anything wrong yeah and you now have along with the brain's observation that you're not fearful of it you also have the corroborating intellectual knowledge of the sarno database of work and his theories about yeah this is not a physical problem that stuff that they found on your mri was a normal abnormality and i've got statistics from studies that show like the older we get the more degenerative we are yeah and at our age there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on bulges herniations for like anywhere from a quarter to like three quarters of the population with no pain yes which is fascinating so if you're being told here's your problem prove it because yes. there's other people my age with the same degeneration that don't have the problems they don't have the pain and so also the thing that you've probably come to conclude is well if i'm so degenerative how come i'll have pain for a few months and then no pain for yeah months or a year and then whammo comes so does that mean the degeneration took a vacation yeah you weren't that, hurting <laughs> that inconsistency though i think is very very important for me to mm -hmm. use to my own advantage to remind myself absolutely yeah to say hey look just don't forget that right don't forget that my and wife is it Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'll, I'll finish with that statement yeah my my wife who's a uh, she's a, a somatic therapist and so she sees people um, with all kinds of uh, challenges and she has a saying that she uses with her clients and she uses with me a lot and she said she she'll say try to stop thinking try to stop thinking so that you can figure this out and what 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 it mean what it means to me is you know you have to you can't think your way out of everything you know you can't you can't solve things intellectually you've kind of got to get out of the way and mm -hmm. let the body do what it was designed to do i mean if i'm slip and i get a cut and i cut my arm open i don't even have to do anything it just heals right. and people forget this that this is like this is like a miracle it's a miracle when my cut my arm open and it heals such that in six or eight or 12 weeks i don't even see it anymore why why if that can happen Right. If, if if that can happen without even me doing anything, I don't even really do it, just put bandage on it. Why can't, why, you know, why are we, these other things happening and just sticking around for years and years? Our fear. Yeah. So we have to not think, try not to think and just trust and just get out of the way so that it can do what it needs to do and, and, and we can let it, let it complete. Yeah. So two things I want to touch on. Uh, a minute ago, we talked about the inconsistency, <laughs> like how your pain would disappear for a couple of months or a year or whatever, <laughs> right? And that just doesn't make sense. And I guarantee, and if this is you watching, I guarantee there's a lot of people there that goes, but my pain never ends. It never stops. Mm -hmm. And so my counter to that argument is it's still very well TMS perceived danger pain. The reason some people's pain doesn't stop is because their fear and focus and obsession on the pain doesn't stop either yes right and so some people like steve had ups and downs i did for a lot of it and then towards the end as i got more and more frustrated with the fact that it wasn't working as easily or as quickly it started to become more persistent and got to the point where it was chronic all the time yes. um but it was still always tms or as i call it perceived danger pain yes. so if your symptoms are persistent and not start stop you know turning on turning off all that means is that your perceived danger is consistent 100 percent. and if you're at a high degree of pain eight out of ten all the time it's because if not consciously subconsciously your brain is terrified that you're in a world of hurt it's only going to get worse this is the rest of your life I'm broken, I'm busted, my body's jacked up, whatever you've learned through the medical experience and through people sending you those god-awful letters. I mean, that was a nocebo. That's a belief yeah. that you 
you're in trouble and it's going to get worse. Yeah. So yeah. you were blessed that you rejected that. I did. You had, you had the intelligence to go, I don't know what's going on, but I'm rejecting that because there's no way in my 20s I'm going to accept this life sentence of you know worsening. You know, and it's 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 important to have the right support around you too, because you know, my wife was very supportive and she said, if that's the way you're gonna go, good. But she could have been the other way. She could have been just saying Are you hey, crazy? Go to the chiropractor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she could have done that. And uh, so I really, you know, um I sure appreciate the way she's yeah. helped me so, take care of my over the years. That's that's wonderful. For the people who don't have that loving support, you can do that for yourself. It is helpful. It is wonderful. Not diminishing that at all. And I wish that for everybody. But there are some people that go, I live by myself. I'm single. Uh, or my partner is not supportive. They think I'm crazy because I'm going down this path. And they're yelling at me every day to go to the damn doctor already. And so what I will tell you for certain is that if you do not have that loving support, you can still get better. You absolutely can. And you can be that loving support for yourself. But it does take clarity, certainty. Um, you got to know what's going on. You got to understand what's causing the symptoms. And once you do, and you know that that applies to you, it doesn't matter if your partner, your kids, your parents, or anybody looks at you like you're a little wacky thinking about this doesn't matter but you know i mean uh you 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 have groups mm -hmm. and uh, i think that's the key is uh, being able to have an opportunity to be a part of a group and then you can see that everybody's kind of thinking similarly and then everybody's able to share and then see the other people in the group and i mean i think that that's great support being able to Right group be part of that and see others progress and also see others have frustration so that you don't think that you're alone. You think that you're yeah. One of the part things of you often in the group is if somebody starts sharing that oh, I'm really struggling with this or this or that. Yeah. I'll say, okay, who else feels the same way? Yes. Inevitably, it's like half the faces on the screen go, me, me, uh, yeah. over here, me. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, the, you can almost see a, a visual sigh. <sighs> okay, I'm not the only yeah. one. I'm not crazy. Yeah. This is normal. It's common. And yeah. there's still a way to recover. Yeah. And so, having others, having others, having others, that when you were able to help somebody, you know, that gets you out of your own head. So if you're sitting here focused in, oh, God, this hurts, this hurts, this hurts. And all of a sudden you get called to help somebody. You forget about your own. You, you don't think so much about your own issues yeah. that are happening inside here. And you're helping somebody else. And then that feels good. And then you help yourself. Which points to one of the, the concepts that I talk about all the time is not distract from the pain. Because that doesn't work. Because that's all fear-based. I got to get away from that. I got to distract but yeah. engage in life. Yeah. When you are engaged in life, in your example, helping somebody else, or it could just be I'm engaged in life because I went to visit my sister for the first time in six months because I just got sick of sitting at home. <laughs> so I, and so I engaged in life. I went over there. We had a nice cup of coffee. We watched our kids playing. I was engaged in life. And they go, so many times the people who share victories and wins and progress in the group calls say, yeah, I had some discomfort, but I didn't care. And it wasn't as bad. Why? Because they weren't sitting there on the couch saying, oh, this hurts, oh, this hurts, oh, this hurts. Yeah. Poor me, poor me. And I'm not saying anybody's, you know, doing something wrong by feeling sorry for themselves because I did that for over a decade. Me too. Right? But when you engage in life and make the experience of life more important than monitoring and trying to figure out and fix your pain, yeah. the brain goes, they're doing something normal. I guess, I guess they're not really in trouble and things can ease down, right? It's how yeah. it works. Yeah. It's how yeah. it works. So well, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you're doing this. Uh, it's uh, I, I, I can only imagine how rewarding it must be just 
being able to to get through it just must be just wonderful so i think you're building a great legacy and i'm really happy for you and i'm glad i found you and i'm so glad i was given the opportunity to oh to, yeah to do this love it and here's a wonderful thing i mean the headline for your success story is going to be 32 years of pain 11 years pain free yeah yeah and, and i really am there's no bs in any of this like i'm there's no this is this is just straight up it's 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 possible yeah. it's uh for those who 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 you know who've been suffering for years uh you know if, like if you sit there and go i've been suffering for 32 years but i'm still here and i can still do all this stuff am i really that is it really that bad and for some know, it is i mean i i work with a lot of people who are on bed sure. rest, can't yeah. get out of bed you know yeah. every step to the toilet is torture and i know. remember yep so there's there's definitely yes it is that bad but it there is a way forward there's a way to recover and reverse it all yes um, yes yeah. it's all driven by the perception of danger not the actual danger because as you found out the degeneration was normal aging and some yeah. of us start earlier you had some at age 25 when i was in my early 30s i had degenerative disc disease on my x-rays too yeah but I feel better 25 years later than I did then. Yes. And so yeah. you use the term, this is possible. Mm -hmm. I like the phrase that when you understand what's going on, accept it and implement these concepts yeah. of really teaching yourself that you're actually okay. It's not just possible to get better. It's probable. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. it's proven. Sarno yeah. figured it out. There's been countless people. We don't even know how many people have benefited by his books and the sharing the books and give it, you know, that yes. one book might have gone to five people and who knows how many people that helped. And um, it's not just possible to get better. If you understand it and accept that this is what's going on, it's probable that you're going to get better. Yeah. It's a matter of time and it's a matter of consistency. The fact that you're okay. Yes. Consistently giving yourself the message that, holy crap i'm really okay yeah eventually your brain's gonna go really yeah okay yeah you are yeah. and the whole system the alarm system turns down and and also um focusing on the little wins and instead of focusing on the little little losses so i got another little win there okay we're gonna mark that yeah we're gonna, mark, we're gonna hold on to that you know there's a little bit when you're in a lot of pain there's a little bit of kind of ownership of that pain. I, I saw that with myself. It was almost like my, um, it was like, it was almost like, Jesus, if I got pain free, what would I do? You know, there's, right. a little bit, there's, a, uh, there's almost a little bit of, you know, this is my identity. And, you know, if I lost my identity, who would I be? And is it even safe to lose all that pain and to be, you know, to be pain free? Well, what, what would I have to do then? You know, like, what would I do? You'd be vulnerable. That's right. You know, like this, having this pain allows me to not do that and not do that and not do that and not have to do that and not have to talk to uh, mom and dad. And, you know, and and I think that, you know, for me, it was also like, am I using this a little bit to my advantage? And I, and I, you know, I think over the years I did a little bit. But had you been given the choice early on in life, you would have never chosen the path of pain. Oh, so, God. No. Anybody who hears, you know, this concept of secondary gain, am I using this to my advantage? There's a lot of people who are going to hear that and go, I'm not doing that. I don't yeah. want this pain. I'm not benefiting by it. Yeah. Um, but inevitably, if we take a good hard look at it, there's plenty of times where I was like, oh, I can't sweep the floor. I can't yeah. cut the lawn. I can't shovel the walk, you know, and I get my 12-year-old kid out there to shovel the snow instead of me. and um yep. it wasn't intentional it wasn't willful it was just like no. i i can't do that otherwise i'm gonna, I'm gonna pay for it yeah so secondary gain can happen but in no way shape or form are we saying to anybody that you're a bad person because no. this or no. it was intentional or you made shit up and you acted like it was like this stuff is real folks uh, i mean steve yeah. had 32 years of some of the most excruciating symptoms. Yeah. So did I. Not 32 years. I was blessed. Only 13. And there's Pain people. Scary. 
There's yep. a, people a year into it going, 13 years, holy crap, do I have that much long to wait? No, you don't. You got yeah. the cheat sheet. Yeah. <laughs> you have the fast start. Yeah. How to get pain, out of this. Pain is scary. Of course. You know, it's it's scary. It's supposed, to be. it's supposed to be because you put your hand on a hot stove. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. makes you jump. Yeah. It's supposed to be scary because it's a warning signal. Yeah. You know, yeah. how effective would a smoke alarm be in a, a big apartment building if it was just like a little beep, 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 <laughs> beep, beep. People would be like, oh, somebody's got to change a battery somewhere, right? Yeah. But when it's blaring and the lights are flashing, people pay attention. So pain is just a warning signal, and it's our job to learn, assess, and make sure this is what's going on with me. And then teach the brain that it's a false alarm because the thing the brain is perceiving is dangerous. The life stress, the whatever's going on, even bodily movements. I don't know about you, but I got to a point where body positions, movements, activities, petrified, things that you stopped doing for a long time. Yes. But they're false alarms because those things were truly never the danger that the brain perceived them to be. And all the brain was doing is trying to keep you safe. And it's our job to go, shh. We're okay. Look, see, I'm good. Watch me. I'm going to do this shrug, right? Yeah. And, and, and uh, also, you know, it's like, oh, God, this hurts like this now, but I've got to go here and I've got to do that later on this afternoon. How much worse could it get? I'm going yeah, to make it worse. Predict the worst, which is doing what? It's fueling that perception of danger. Yeah. So that's why I talk about the two key things you have control over, which is expect the best. And if you hurt, respond as well as possible. Yes, because if you expect the worst, like oh boy, I got to do this. I got this long trip to wherever I'm going, yeah. and it's going to be horrible. How am I ever going to make it on that 12-hour plane flight? Yeah, all you're doing is setting up the stage for a horrible flight. <laughs> yeah. True, but other people who go, well, I'm going anyway, so I'll make the best of it. Inevitably, they come back and share in the group. You know what? It went way better than I thought it would. But yeah. yet, they spent four months before that predicting the worst and watching the horror movie in their head you know, a thousand times before the trip. Mm -hmm. And then they come back saying, I'm so glad I went. Yeah. Because they engaged in life. And they finally said, I'm not going to let fear stop me. So I'm going to go. And the brain goes, oh, okay. Because up until that point, the brain was just trying to convince you not to go with the negative thoughts and the symptoms. Yeah. But once you're there, the brain's like, I guess we're here. So anyway, I'm sure we could talk about it all day. This mm -hmm. was brilliant. I appreciate your story. I appreciate you being willing to share. This is great. I appreciate the Thanks. kind of words for my work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I really think that you know you you know you you're, you're well set up. I watch your videos all the time. I just play them. You know, you. I while, love you're making, while you're making coffee or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great, and uh, you know, pain or no pain doesn't matter. They're good. Well, I appreciate it. Well, for example, uh, I think it was. Today, yeah, today's video is all about um, how to how to change your self esteem. It has nothing to do with pain. Yeah, it's important. Oh, so we'll watch it. All right, Steve. Real Thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much. This will probably Thank be up you. in a few days, maybe by the early next week. Just keep an eye on the YouTube channel. And uh, for anybody who's interested, success stories are going to be at painfreeusuccess.com. And for anybody looking for the YouTube channel, it's, well, you're watching it, but you may be seeing this on Facebook too, but dansyoutube.com. That'll jump you right to the YouTube channel and the videos. And uh, Steve, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And you. if I can ever do anything for you or anybody you know, send them my way. I'll say I'll be, you know, I won't be giving them the book. I'll be sending them to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You. Have a good day. You too.